Um, I've been giving this talk for 10 years. <laughs> um, I think half of you guys have seen this, right? Um, so I can go fast, but please, I'm here to ask, ask me questions. Ask me questions about this or anything else. I'm here to even answer, I'll answer anything. Um, if you have, if you want other things about what I'm talking about, let me know. So this is the kernel um, right now. I'm going to cover the past year's worth of what we did in the kernel. Um, we finally broke 18 million lines of code, uh, 46,000 files. Um, it's big. We're going, we're increasing at a linear rate though, so we've been increasing at a very constant rate for the past 10 years that I've been calculating this stuff. So you can draw a graph and see where we're going to be in another five years. It's pretty regular. Um, for the past year, we broke 3,000 developers again. That's a lot. It's the largest kernel, uh, largest software engineering project ever. Um, and at least 417 companies. I'm thinking there's really 450. I haven't asked the last two kernel releases a uh, few companies are, who's working for what. That's what we know. Um, that is the largest project ever. Anybody's ever done. So, this is our rate of change. And for a traditional software project, um, you make something and you stop. And it's all nice and stable and everything's um, working and you don't ever change anything. This is what the Linux kernel is running at. Which isn't that so bad until you realize what the rate is. Um, and it's not just the um, drivers. The drivers of the kernel make up 55% of the code. Um, the architecture specific is about 40% of the code. The core of the kernel is five. 5% 5 of these changes are in the core. 55% of the changes are in the drivers. It's completely linear across the whole thing. Everything we do is changing everywhere. And it comes down to this number. Um, seven and a half changes an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number keeps going up. Um, we're kind of plateauing at the seven, but the 310 kernel, we did nine. That's the fastest we've ever, ever gone. And then we went back down to seven. Um, this is a huge rate of change. There's no way that anybody can catch up to us with this rate of change. We thought we were going too fast, but we're doing two changes now. Um, we're doing seven changes now, or seven and a half. And so no other company is ever going to catch up to us. But what this also means is, and especially pertaining to embedded, if you, you're going to have to branch the kernel to make a product. And you're going to add changes to it. You cannot maintain that branch on your own and expect ever to catch up to us. You're going to want the changes that we have. You're going to need to pull it back. You're going to have to merge that all the time. You're going to have to get your code upstream in order to make your next product. Because you cannot compete with this. There's no way. And this number keeps going up. So the fact that it goes up. So two years ago, we were doing six changes an hour. So if you know you were making a product two years ago and you saw what the kernel community did in about a year's worth of time, think, oh, I can handle that. Well, now we're going faster. So a year's worth of time, you're doing more work. So that means you can, you're can you going to get even more behind. So you have to realize that. You have to become part of the kernel community. And um, Zaka-san has a very good talk about why you need to be part of the kernel community. Um, so in the kernel, we do two things that how we do all this stuff. We do time-based releases, and we do tiny incremental changes. Time-based releases, we started about eight years ago. We said, how are we going to do a kernel? We don't want to do this long development process of two and three and four years. So let's do a new release every two to three months. So for the past eight years, we've been doing it actually every two and a half months, very, very regular. And that's really good, because that means if you don't get your code in this kernel, you can get into the next one, or you miss the deadline. So it isn't like we're having to have pressure to get features in for a specific kernel release. Two and a half months is very easy to figure, to wait another one. Um, it also means that you can, if you're going to build a product, you can figure out what number kernel release you're going to need for that product. So you can say, okay, I want to do a kernel, I want to make a product for uh, December to ship, so that means I need to go back to maybe I'll pick a kernel in August, and that's going to be, oh, the 2 or the 313 kernel, or whatever it is. Going to be. So managers like this, they can plan things. It's just a number, but it makes things more fun. So here's how we do things. So um, Linus does a release, let's call it 3.1. And then for two weeks in here, all the maintainers, the subsystem maintainers, send all the stuff to Linus. We have a merge window, and I'll talk more about that. They just release candidate one, and from here on out, it's bug fixes only, or regressions, or revert things. So every week he does another release candidate two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's been doing them on Sundays uh, or Saturdays. He does them on the weekend. 
Um, so you have a week's worth of time to do some work. We're at six right now. I think we just did a release yesterday. So um, this bug fix is only and when things stable and uh, and slow down. We think we got a good one. He does another release. So this is two and a half months. And for, eight, or for a couple of years we did this and everything was working out well, but we realized, what about the bug fixes? What about the people that are stuck on this kernel release because they want to release kernel version? Are the security updates? So we came up with the idea of the stable kernel releases. So I do these. I do these stable kernel releases. I take Linus's code and I do bug release, 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 release. Um, about once a week I do these. Um, the thing is, what is in these stable releases has to be in Linus's tree. So I can't take something that's not there. Otherwise, we would diverge. And I don't ever want to diverge. So it has to be in Linus's tree, and then I'll take it. Um, now we're making the rule that it has to be in a release candidate. It has to be in one of these releases. So if something comes in during this week, I need to wait to like here to get it. Because we've had some problems where fixes went in that didn't really fix things. So we wait a week. So it's about a week's worth of time to wait. I do these releases, and then this 3, 1, 6, and then I'll drop them on the floor. I'll stop and start with a new one. And that's really powerful. I don't have to keep maintaining it. Why not? But people who are relying on these can do this. But it's throwing them away. This, this stopping doing release doesn't work well for products or enterprise distros or anything like that. So what we came up with the idea is some long-term kernels. And we were doing this haphazardly for a long time until a couple years ago. I said, here's the rules. So I'm going to pick one a year. I'm going to maintain it for two years. So right now, the 3.4 kernel and the 3.10 kernel are the long-term kernels. Um, the 3.14 kernel is going to be the next long-term kernel. I'll maintain that for two years. And actually, 3.4, um, somebody else is going to pick that up and maintain that for a long time in the community, which is very nice. I'm not the only one who does maintain long-term kernels. Uh, the 3.2 kernel is maintained by Ben from Debian, because Debian is maintaining it for five years. Um, the three, no, the two six thirty two kernel is actually slowly maintained. There's about one release a year. We just did another release, um, so that's maintained a long time. Um, and three twelve is maintained by Susan in the community, so that's going to be maintained for a long time too. But these are the ones I maintain. So then I take these kernels and then I build something called LTSI off of it with the Linux Foundation. And LTSI, um, are you going to talk about LTSI? No. Okay, good. He can talk. About it. So basically, it's a bunch of stuff that people build products on top of. So a lot of LTSI shows up in a lot of products. Um, so that's what we do in the kernel. That makes sense? Question? Yes? Yes? How do you think about what, what is the next, next uh, APS? Just a second. I can repeat the question. Maybe. Everybody will be listening quite. What do you think? Which is the next version of the long term stable? 3.14. 3.14. It was announced yesterday. Just a little bit of so how, how, how do you decide the features that are long-term kernel? How do I pick it? So how, how do you decide? So I, I talk to people. I talk to companies and figure out what when they're building products and what would work and what not. And traditionally, these have been picked. Uh, this is the kernel that's released in the late summer. So um, it works out well for some companies because they're going to build a product to ship for the Christmas, the holiday season. But it turns out um, it usually misses it because they've, picked, they've done all their work before. And with LTSI, we did an LTSI release in January of that kernel, mm -hmm. and that missed everybody. So. Is there any conflicts? Some company want to uh, keep this as their LTS, but another is another kind of like Yeah, companies can do whatever they want, but if they want to take advantage of me. So I try to talk to lots of different ones to figure out what's going to work best for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I look at now the real-time kernel patches are done only on even numbers. And I was thinking the 315 kernel would work out well, but they're not going to do a patch for that. So I grabbed the 314. Um, we'll see how it goes. But I talk, it can't please every company, but I try and get a large group of them. Hopefully 314 will work better. It's getting better over the time, but it works better. Um, and you don't have to pick this kernel. There's nothing you have to do. You can do all the work on your own. It's great. Um, but I'm just trying to do something to help other people. Yeah. Uh, 
Just a little bit. 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 Just It, it is fast, but um, if you look, I'll show you how we get patches merged. It, it really, it, we could do it faster. Um, we can't do it, doing it slower makes no sense. So, um, yeah. Anything else? So let's talk about how we do this. So, I said we have 3,000 developers, individual developers. So all those developers make a patch. They make a change to the kernel. They want to add a new driver. They want to do something. So they send it an email. To the maintainer of that file that they're going to change or that area. And so we have 3,000 of these. All the maintainers of all the files and all the little drivers um, are listed in the kernel as well. There's about 700 of these people. So it sends an email saying, here's the patch, here's the change, and what do you, is it okay? And here's an example of what a patch looks like. There you go. So Robert wrote the patch. This is later on, but I committed it to Git. So if you have a one-line subject that says USB on the go, fix the bug on the remove path, and then a body of text saying why you're doing this. You want to explain why you're making this change, what problem you're solving. Not what you're doing, because we can read the code to figure out what you're doing, but why it's needed. So it turns out that we need to refer we need to check to see if X is actually not null before we dereference it. Otherwise we crash. One line patch. And so he says that. Um, and then he signs off by. He has that line of his thing. And signs off by is what we use in the kernel to show we're contributing this code and we agree to it. And here's what it means. Um, it's in the documentation of the directory, but here's the summary of it. It means that, well, you guys can read that. Um, the last one is important. It's public. It's the right license. Um, it's also not anonymous. I cannot take anonymous contributions to the kernel. It's that simple. So that's what it means. I'll go back. Um, so then the maintainer of the subsystem, he said, I acknowledge that it was good. He could say signed off by as well. And then me, as a maintainer, I sign off by it as well. Oh, it's an old patch. Susan. <laughs> 2009. Yeah. Um, so that's it. So this signed off by, every line of code in the kernel can be traced to two people, at least two people, one person who created it and one person who reviewed it. Um, that's, you can pick any line of code in the kernel and say, what, who made this change? That's a huge, hugely powerful thing. It's the best audited body of code in the world because we know where every, all those 18 million lines of code, we know where it all came from. You can also see, it's also like a path of blame. If this is broken and this is wrong, you can say, hey, Greg, David, Robert, what were you doing? What were you thinking about? <laughs> and fix it. But it's also individuals. We don't do anything among companies. The kernel development community is all about individuals. And these individuals are responsible because their name is on it. We don't care who you work for. Um, we just care about the individuals. And that's how we establish trust between individuals. I'll talk a little bit more about that, too. So, so then these people. So if you have a file, so say a driver, a USB serial driver, there's a, there's a maintainer of the USB serial subsystem. He will then send those changes and acknowledge it to the subsystem maintainer, like USB. So like I maintain USB, I maintain TTY, serial, driver core, staging, a lot of weird stuff. Um, subsystem maintainers have a public tree. And um, I think we have about 100 subsystem maintainers. It's hard to tell because like I have like four different trees. So you can't count the number of trees. It's about 150 public trees that we have. Um, so these have a public kernel tree you can check it into. And then every single day, or night, depending on where in the world you are, they get pulled into one tree called Linux Next. Stephen Rothwell in Australia does this. He puts them all, pulls them all together, he merges them all, and he does build testing. And he lets us know what went wrong. Because sometimes in the kernel, you don't have, the subsystems don't own it exclusively. I can't say no, nobody else can touch this code. Which is really good. Anybody can modify the USB code. Like the networking guys, the networking guys are changing APIs or finding problems. They might change code in the USB stuff. Well, when we merge things together, we see what the conflicts were. We see what happened there. And that gets tested every single day. And then Andrew Morton is out here on his own. He's picking up parts of the kernel that aren't maintained. We have a lot of parts of the kernel that have no maintainer. 
or he picks up files that are patches on mailing lists that nobody happened to notice. So he sucks stuff up and it gets merged in the next. And this happens every single night, a weekday, so five times a week. Um, that's how we do things. So 3,000, 700, 100, and then one. So you want to see what's going to be the next kernel release, not Linux history. Well, Linux is next. That's what the last thing is. So then I said when Linus opens the merge window, we all as subsystem maintainers shove stuff to Linus. As a developer, if you're not a subsystem maintainer, you don't care about the merge window. It means nothing to you. Because as a maintainer, it's up to me to take patches all the time, put them into the right trees, and send them to Linus at the proper time. So don't worry about merge windows unless you're a maintainer. So there's only about 100 people that really need to worry about that and scheduling, if you want to care about scheduling. Everybody else, just keep doing work, keep sending things. It doesn't matter. But Linus doesn't pull from next. And that's really powerful as well. The subsystem maintainers have to tell Linus, take this code. Because sometimes it's broken. As an example, the TTY layer, my code, um, was broken for a while. There was, in one of these, my trees, was, it wasn't working. It was having real problems. So I said, hey, I'm going to skip this merge window. The next one I'll get it. So there, two and a half months, not a big deal. I'll fix it up, we got it fixed, so the next one, we got it in. If Linus pulled from next, he would have taken broken code. We don't want that to happen. We want these people to make the judgment call when it goes to Linus. And that's what I mean. So Linus trusts people, the subsystem maintainers, to get it right. Subsystem maintainers trust these people, and they just have to trust the individual developers. It's a web of trust. Um, so there's some code some people, like maintainers of files and sub tiny subsystems under me, that I trust all the time. I take the code, I don't even really worry about it. And it's not that I trust that they got it right, I trust they'll be there and fix it if they got it wrong. And that's really, really important, because when I take code from you, if it's wrong, I'm now responsible for it, because you can disappear. So I need to trust that you're gonna be around. The networking developers, about a, a number of years ago, took this massive, horrible, huge changes the day after it was accepted, the email address disappeared. It took them six months to unwind the mess. They don't ever want to do that again. It is really hard to get core networking changes accepted these days. And that's good because it's a burden on me, on the networking maintainers, to make that fix. You have to become part of the kernel community, a trusted member, before it's easy to get code in. And that's on purpose. Because I want to make sure that you're going to be around to fix the problems of that code. I want you to fix my code, you want me to fix your code, but I'm not going to take on the burden of more and more code without some knowledge that you're going to be around. You've got to realize it's a personal thing, it's a trust. So some people I trust, they just trust some people, and that's it, it's a web of trust. And it looks like a pretty diagram, all this pyramid. I graphed it about five or six years ago. It was five or six meters long by two meters high, huge mess. <laughs> Which is good. It's a good networking topology because if any one of us disappear, I've been on travel. I've been traveling for the past three weeks. People are starting to route things around me, and that's fine. I can handle that. If any one of us disappears, gets sick, passes away, we've had people die. Um, we're getting older. We're okay. We're okay. We can route around them, and it works really well. Some people start getting slower. Some maintainers um, stop accepting patches because they're doing other things at work. You can route around them. It's not absolute control over your subsystem, and that's really good. Question. Yes. Uh, I think the, uh, it's very important to keep the maintainer uh, high, uh, uh, high performance if you create a good quality code. So is there any, any, any system to check a maintainer is a good quality or not? That if, we're, if the maintainer is doing a good job? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, is there any way to know this maintainer is trustful or not? Uh, we, it takes time to become a maintainer. Mm -hmm. So, like you become a maintainer um, because we say, hey, you've been doing a good job, why don't you take over this code? And so that's, we, we trust them over the time. So mm -hmm. I pass sub some subsystems off onto other people. It happens a lot. I used to be maintaining a lot of other stuff. Um, so yeah, we have to trust them, but we also, some people disappear, so we go, okay, great, we got code, now who's gonna maintain this? Mm -hmm. And we ask around. So, my answer to that is, uh, what happens is that you don't detect it from the top. It, more, more often, if there's a maintainer who's kind of not doing his job, you detect it from the bottom. Oh, the people, bottom, definitely. People notice, you know, they're trying to push stuff up and it's not going anywhere. And, and what Greg said, it, it, stuff just starts to kind of naturally work around. 
yeah. that person. So. Andrew starts taking things. <laughs> yeah. Andrew's really good at that. He will take things where we had some one subsystem, the frame buffer, where we thought we had maintainers, and nobody had realized nobody had talked to them for two years. <laughs> <laughs> we actually don't know what happened to them. So he started sending patches around, and then finally somebody else said, hey, I'll take this and do that. But it is a problem, because we do have some maintainers. If they're not doing their job, how do we get rid of them? And we can't. It's a social issue, right? I, there is one subsystem right now that there are people pushing from below, and it's, he, the maintainer here doesn't work in that area anymore. His job is doing something else, so he's not really paying attention. He doesn't care as much, but he doesn't want to give it up. So he'll like take patches for one kernel release, and then like he'll stop for two or three, and then people will complain to other people and start to route around, and he'll wake up and do that. And it's a hard managerial social issue. It's a huge social issue. How do we fix that? And that's a problem I have right now. It's a problem we have at times. Sometimes, some subsystem maintainers go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not networking, or no, not networking, um, storage. Storage, like the IDE driver maintainers, have traditionally, we've had a number of them, have all gone crazy. <laughs> um, and they disappear. So that's, that's gets hard. To um, it's, but we're dealing with people, and we're dealing with individuals, and it's hard. It's a hard social, social issue. But we get together, we see each other, the subsystem um, main groups meet about once a year. So we'll have a networking me meeting. We'll have a file system storage meeting. Uh, we finally had a USB meeting. Um, the kernel summit is where all these people, the top people, get together once a year and talk about procedural issues, not necessarily technical issues. But the subsystem people get together once a year, or twice a year, depending on the subsystem, and talk about technical issues, how to solve them, how they're doing. So that works good now. I'm kind of wondering who, uh, it, does Netcan have one big repository or a separate repository for our system? So, yeah, that's a good question. So on git.kernel.org, there's a lot of kernel trees. So Linus has one kernel tree. I have like five <laughs> with different branches inside them. So we all have individual trees. Nobody, I can't write to Linus's tree. We can't share, we, nobody shares kernel trees. Some of the subsystem maintainers, I think there's one or two share a kernel tree. Everybody else has individual ones, and we send individual requests to Linus to pull. So that works out well. Um, if you guys are familiar with how GitHub does things, you branch a private repo, you make some changes, and then you send a merge request back. Um, GitHub method of working does not scale for the kernel. It can't work at all. A lot of projects you start off in GitHub are having running into that. The Docker team is running into that. They can't scale with the GitHub method of working. Um, I can handle, look at all the patches we, we go through, look at all the changes, we'll talk some more about numbers, but um, it all works through email. Very, very fast, very efficient. And it works, email works really well for people with English not as their first language. Because um, you can write, write to me, I'll, re I'll write, respond, and you can think about my response. You can look at it, you can wait a day, you can see how it works, and then respond back. It isn't a face-to-face -face meeting, which is good. It isn't on IRC, This is faster response. It works really well. And we live all around the world, so IRC doesn't work well anyway. So we don't have IRC channels, it's just all through email. We have a lot of email. Are, how many of the uh, subsystem maintainer trees are off kernel.org? Are there? Hopefully none. Oh, really? There are, are, there are, there's are. There's a few on GitHub. I will not take pull requests from GitHub. Oh, really? We don't trust GitHub repos. Um, if you are a subsystem maintainer, we'll give you a kernel.org account. Um, there's um, infradead.org, which is another bunch of kernel hackers. They have their own servers. There's a few trees on that. But most everything's moved back to kernel.org. What about like down a layer? Are there like sub subsystem maintainers? I mean, because it seems like there's a bunch of trees scattered all over the place. Oh, there are. There's a bunch of other people. So like, there's and they're usually on kernel.org. But I don't, so I take a lot of patches. I don't, I only take pull requests from two people. And I deal with over five, I deal between seven and 800 individuals a year. Um, I take everything to you. It works out much better. Uh, and it works out usually good for the sub maintainers as well. They can keep their own Git trees, they can clean things up and get them right, and then they can send them to me, and they're not worried about it. Because these trees that we have are public, and they don't rebase. We cannot rebase. If we commit something to there, we're, we are guaranteed that's going to be there. So we can revert it or do a change on top of it, but we can't rebase it. A lot of work down here, if you send me something and I say, no, go back and fix it, you have to fix it and send a new copy. So you don't want it in a Git tree. Or you can keep it in your own local Git tree and clean it up and send it. 
but I won't pull from it. And then you can throw it all away because nobody's basing it on restarting it. Um, the, the, it gets deep in some of the architecture specific, like the ARM SOC trees. I think they're like three or four levels deep on some maintainers. Um, Dave Miller for networking pulls from the wireless guys, he pulls from the Bluetooth people. So there are, uh, there's a level in here of subsystem maintainers. And Linus, this past week, said um, at the at LinuxCon Japan, he, wants, he likes it when he sees subsystem maintainers have people underneath them pulling from Git2 because it shows that our, our method is spreading out. Because these are the bottleneck in the kernel development process. We need more maintainers and we need more work. I mean, I average um, about a thousand emails a day I get, not including mail inputs that I have to deal with. That's a lot. And we need more people helping people like me. So if we have people that we can pull and trust from, it's working out well. And our depth is getting bigger over time. Anything else about how we do this? Maybe that's good for my presentation. Yes? I have to, I have a question about an LT. How do you choose um, which, which patch you uh, need, need to back for? Oh, good, good question. Um, it's up to these people to pick a patch, or these people. If you say, here's a bug fix, when you send it, you can add a little tag that says, copy the stable kernel maintainer. And then when it goes, that patch ends up in Linus's tree, I get an automatic email of that patch. And then I run it through my scripts, and I apply it to the stable tree. So it's up to the maintainers what to mark. So I require these people to do the work of what to mark. Um, it's getting better over the years. There's still some subsystems that don't do anything. And I yell at them and then try to do um, It's getting better, but um, it's up to these people to do it. Or the developer. If the developer says, this is a bug fix. I know it's been there for two years. Please send it to the stable tree. But some subsystems, like networking, he will make up his own set of patches and send them to me on his own, which works well because he tests them. But I don't require that. And there's rules also of what we will accept into a stable patch backport. Um, it has to be no new features, a bug fix only, or add a new device ID, and it has to be an obvious fix, usually under 100 lines of change. So we have rules in the documentation of how, um, what, what we'll accept. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. My question is, uh, the developers uh, write some uh, patches uh, and they uh, submit to the maintainers, right? Um, so how to uh, ensure the patches are correct or not correct, uh, just uh, by the maintainer? Yeah, you mean how do we test? Okay. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> ideally, we can test, but ideally, so I also said we um, rely on incremental changes. So I, you can't send me a patch that says here is a I'm rewriting the USB subsystem to be, to, to be different at once. It has to be one change only in your patch. You have to make it obvious and simple and easy to review. So if you want to redo the USB subsystem, you have to send me 100 patches yes. every tiny step. And then I read them, and I just read them. I say, oh, look, this is obviously right or wrong. And that. And then we also test. So I take my, when I accept the patches, mm -hmm. I take them to my machine. If it's something that I have, I'll test them before I pushed out to the public tree. But a lot of things for drivers that we don't have hardware for, it looks right, it builds, I'll take it. So, yeah, so it's that way. Um, and so it has to be obviously right. But unless you're adding a new driver, you can add a driver in one patch, because it doesn't touch anything else. But you have to break down and show your work on each step. So then I might, if you send me a patch, a series of 10 patches, I might say, oh, I'll take the first five, go back and work the rest of them. Which is good. That way you get half your work in and make sure to work easier. Okay, so uh, one more question is, uh, in the speaker, uh, Greg is in which uh, position? The subsystem maintainer? Me? Me? Yeah. yeah, I am one of these right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, here I go. Thank you. Um, when you take, uh, I mean, when you are using I think in fixes for the LTS kernel, 
you take both uh, pixels from upstream, backbone, but also from the previous LTS uh, kernel. And sometimes I think uh, they don't apply cleanly. They need some some uh, previous patches or some manual touching. Uh, what happens to those patches? Somebody actually fixes them, or the bug, those bugs are not fixed in the end? Some, um, I'll look at them. I look at them. I see what, how they apply to other ones. If it's something obvious, I'll fix it. Um, like a file rename got moved somewhere else. I fix it. Otherwise, I'll push back and say, hey, this doesn't, if you said this applied to the 310 kernel and it doesn't, you'll get an automatic email from me saying, this didn't apply. If you want it, if you want it there, send me the fix. You'll get an automatic email for that. So um, you might see those every once in a while. If you have me copy down a bug, you'll see a big failed email that says this failed. You also see patches that if you say should be unstable and aren't, they don't meet the criteria, I'll have, I have emails that will go back saying, what are you doing? <laughs> you should not be doing this. So, but as far as going back to the old ones, after two years, the applicability of patches falls off. It almost, because we change so much, um, they don't even apply. They don't, they're not relevant at all. So after two years, that's why I only do two years worth of work. Um, it's up, they don't even, they're not relevant. Some of them are slowly, but not the majority. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Got you got the band. I got more. I got more. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my big mistake. <laughs> so I want to show so how much work people do. This is interesting. This is top developers last year by quantity, not quality. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. So um, these are interesting things. So partly um, works on the comedy subsystem, which is data acquisition drivers, and he's cleaning them up and fixing them. Um, Thirteen hundred patches were accepted, not applied, not, not he created, because a lot of patches get rejected, right? This is what accepted. He's actually slowed down. Um, he had 1,800 last year, he just had a baby, so he's, uh, he's slowing down a little bit, but he's still back there. Um, so Sasha and Jingo and we, um, they all are doing janitorial patches through the whole kernel. They'll see, here's a, a pattern, a common pattern of a bug, let's fix it everywhere. And they'll get patches accepted everywhere. And that's really, really good and very important for the kernel. We want to be able to ability to sweep the whole tree and clean things up as we notice over time. You have some people just sending spelling fixes for comments. And that's really good because it's you want to see that the code is being maintained and managed over time. So for these guys that do these big sweeps, do they record anywhere? Like if there's like kind of a uh, a pattern yes. that's faulty, do they put it somewhere? That yes. <laughs> so um, there's a tool we have called Coccinelli. Um, and you can write rules in it, and it'll sweep the tree, and it'll create patches based on those rules. And then when you add, um, when we create those rules, there's a whole tree in the kernel directory of these rules, of these patterns. So when people check code in, maintainers usually run those rules against the patch submissions and make sure they don't break again. So yes, so we do keep track of those things, and that's really good. So it's automatic. So people make fun of the janitorial people that are just doing Oh, they're just doing cleanups and just doing stuff. It's really hard to get 1,300 patches accepted. It's a lot of work. Try it yourself. We had one subsystem maintainer that I, on a, I got really mad at because he was saying, oh, they're just doing cleanup patches. It's nothing. I'm like, well, wait, you did 40 patches last year, and you're a maintainer. Uh, these people are doing an order of magnitude more work and cleaning up more fixes. And that's what's really important. Other projects don't let people touch code outside their areas, like OpenStack. It's really hard to touch a different sub-module, a different thing. You have to become part of that member. We let people change everything, and that's really, really good, because we want the ability to have everybody clean up everything. So they do that. They also do some ARM work. Jinga does some frame buffer work. Lawrence, um, video for Linux. Alex, um, frame buffer, I think? I don't know what Alex does. Mark Brown, embedded sound. Hans, video for Linux. Video for Linux. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of media drivers. Alvero, core VFS work. Um, so that's some areas of the code of the kernel that's changing. So here's also, so you saw signed off by. This is all I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that patch is accepted. So Dave Miller, Dave Miller came up, he's networking um, stuff. 
lot of other stuff. Um, he came up with the idea of maintainers are like editors for a company. We see other people's code, we correct it, we say, hey, wouldn't it be nice to do this? Go off and do that. And every once in a while, we have a side project of our own. <laughs> but we're just reviewing and maintaining code. So we're, all we do is review code. Um, David, Linus, Andrew. So Linus, our numbers are higher than Linus because Linus pulls from our tree and doesn't see the patches that come through us. He doesn't do that. Andrew goes everything through email. So Andrew always sends everything through email from Linus. Linus pulls from other people. So Mark Brown, Embedded Sound, Mario Video for Linux, Daniel Better, um, Intel Graphics, John Linville, Wireless, uh, Raphael's Power Management, HTK, and then Hartley, on his own, he's not a maintainer of anything else, on his own, his own patches got him the top side <laughs> <laughs> So here's an example of one person working for one company, who works for a company um, called Vision Engraving, they make some devices that use Linux, making a huge difference to the kernel community. So one person can make a huge difference. Let's talk, who funds these people? This is kind of fun, always. So I've been tracking these over a long time. So amateurs and unknown are now making up 15% of the contributions. And that's actually going down. So you can look at it and say, it used to be about 20%. So you can look at it and say, 15% is done by amateurs, or 85% is done by companies. But it turns out, if you get five patches into the kernel, you will be hired. <laughs> Good job. So all these people who are amateurs, that's a huge number of people all doing a small number of work. Half of the people that contributed to those 3,000 developers last year, half of those people only got one patch in. And that's great. So there are a lot of those people that are there. Half the half got two. Half the half the half got three. It's a curve. Luckily, the top part, we're actually flattening out. We used to be really, really steep. We're flattening out. We have about 200 people are doing about 60% of the work now. It used to be 20 people did 80% of the work. We've got a lot better. So Intel now beat Red Hat for the first time for a year. Lenaro, Samsung, Unknown. Unknown are people that we don't know who they work for, or we do and they don't want to say publicly, which is fine. IBM, TI, SUSE, consultants, we call it, line a lump together. Let's go on Vision and Gravy. So this is Hartley, one guy. <laughs> it's his company at number 11. So that's 1,300 patches. And that's, again, amazing. And so one guy, one company, who this company relies on Linux, is contributing that much. And that's important. So if your company relies on Linux, I get this speech with lots of companies, um, are you trusting that these companies are driving Linux forward in the best interest of your company? Because everybody contributes to Linux in a selfish way. Google's doing it for the things Google cares about. Microsoft used to be on the top 20. They were doing it the things that Microsoft cared about. And that's great. We all want that. But if you're trusting that those other companies have your company's interests in mind, it's not going to happen. You need to get involved. So Renesis, very good. <laughs> well, Google, Freescale, NVIDIA, Huawei. Um, AMD is interesting, they're still hanging around. They let go all their kernel developers, so they're gonna disappear in a minute. Um, FOSS, number nine team. So there's a program through the Gnome Foundation to get women involved in development, and we, have, we run it two times a year, and it works like Google Summer of Code. As part of the application process for that, you have to get patches accepted into the kernel. The women involved in that, and then when they got accepted, there was about 10, got 19th out of all companies. So student interns with no kernel programming experience beat 400 other companies. <laughs> now they're really good. They're really brilliant women and they're doing a wonderful job. So I'm not decrying, decrying that. What I'm making fun of is all the other companies. You, every, there are huge areas of work that we need to be done. These interns were able to pick up, they saw areas that were that were made there, that we needed to work in, and they contributed. Why aren't these other companies contributing? So, I don't make fun of companies. So, any questions about companies? Or individuals? And um, to answer the question, I know somebody's thinking, I don't track what country the contributions come from. Um, which is interesting because a lot of people thought I was German for a long time because I had a German email address. But I live in the United States in Seattle. So um, tracking companies is, countries is very hard. Um, John Corbett um, did a paper um, or an article about a year ago, or half a year ago. He tracked um, when the time zones for the patches were contributed. <laughs> and by doing that, you can figure out what country your patches came from. It was the exception that there's one overlapping one in India and Australia. But it actually worked out really well, so you can see where things were. So he actually broke things down by country, which is pretty interesting. So North America, um, 
Europe, and then Japan was number three, and then it went down from there. Um, so that was interesting. But then there's some of us, like as I travel around the world, it's saying my check-ins are now coming from Japan. So <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about how you can get involved. The best thing you can do is run the kernel.org release on your machine. If you have any problems, let us know. Because if you don't let us know, it works for me, it's not going to get fixed. So you have to run it, and you have to let us know. So run it, build it. There's a whole book out there on how to build a kernel, how to download it, how to configure it, how to install it. It's free, online. Um, download it and look at it. Um, it tells you how to get involved, how to build your own kernel. It's really good. I wrote it. It's actually translated into Japanese, so you can go to the bookstore here and buy it. Um, the Japanese version is not free, the English version is <laughs> They have to pay for translators. Um, if you want to know how we do our work, how I talked about the development process, that whole tree, we have a whole documentation development process book that's in the kernel directory. Um, we have a how-to file on how to get involved. The how-to file has been translated in Japanese and Korean and Chinese. I don't know, has this been translated in Japanese? Can you translate the development process? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Partially? Okay, because it's, it's a big text. Um, but there's other documentation in the kernel directory that's been translated to other, other languages. Uh, Japanese, um, other languages. There's a README that's also translated. Um, if you want, we take patches for our documentation in other languages. I accept those patches. I have no idea what the patches are. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a um, high executive at one of the Japanese companies that does the translation for some of these. And he says, I can get patches into the Linux kernel. Why can't all my engineers get patches? <laughs> so it works out. That's really good. Um, if you want to get involved, the kernelnewbies.org website, really, really good. It has a very good wiki that describes all the changes that have happened in the kernel releases. It documents how to write your first patch, how to do some good things. There's a mailing list on there that's very easy, very low volume. You can ask anything on it. It's a very good place to ask questions. You're just starting out. There's an IRC channel. And you look and there's like three to four hundred people in the IRC channel and nobody's saying anything. It's just there for asking questions. So just ask your question and then people will answer it. The good thing about the IRC channel is if nobody can answer your question, they can find out where, who they sh you should ask or they'll track us down. So like if I'm traveling or something else, somebody will be, and I'm not on there, somebody will be able to get a hold of me somehow and say, oh, go answer this question. It's a really good resource. I really recommend it. If you want to know how to write your first patch, um, I gave a presentation at FOSDEM a number of years ago. It's on YouTube, just Google that. Um, it tells you how, how you break, how to set up your email client, how to do this, how to get everything involved, and how to do it. It works out well. I think I just changed the spelling text on stage, wrote the email, the email came back, I committed it. So, made it work. Um, if you don't know what you want to do, and you want a list, there's a cutoff to do. On the kernel newbie site, there's a list of janitorial tasks. It's kind of a little bit out of date, but it gives you an idea of what we as maintainers want. Like I say, oh, I really would, somebody would be nice if he fixed his API to do this else. That's listed there. It's a good idea what to do. Uh, this is showed up uh, a couple months ago. I cannot pronounce it. It's a Latin for little penguin. Um, you can Google little penguin kernel challenge and find it, or you can type that out. Um, it's modeled off through the Monsanto challenge in that it works, they, uh, it's all through email. You send an email and then they'll send you a task. You complete the task, you email the results back. It's which is just like kernel development. It's all through email, it's slow, it's at your own pace, and it all works interactively. It's a bunch of scripts handling it. And, you, and the tasks get harder and harder and harder as you go on. I think there's 20 of them. Linux Weekly News wrote up a summary of how it all works this past week. It's been written up on Linux.com. Um, it's really nice. It's really good. It, it takes you through the whole section of the kernel, large, different areas of the kernel. It slowly gets fat, uh, more hard. Um, they also, two of the tasks are getting patches accepted into the kernel. So people going through this actually get code accepted into the kernel tree, which is nice. It's a new thing. So I recommend that as a good thing to start with. Um, the next driver project I run, um, in the kernel tree itself, I have to do this. The driver staging, all the directories. This staging directory is all a bunch of horrible vendor drivers or bad code. There's a list of what needs to be done to them in order to get them out of there. Do it. A lot of it is just like fix the formatting, so you can do that. A lot of it's really obvious stuff, so fix the stuff up and get it merged. It's a great place to start. Lots and lots of people start here. You can adopt a driver, get it going, get it cleaned up, and move out of it. But there, a list of things to do. And that's it. So now we
I have penguin picture. <laughs> uh, the presentation is on GitHub uh, with all the notes. It's an uh, open presentation. You can do it. Um, see that? Download it and spread it around. Any final? Final question plan? <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much.